Hello everyone. The last but not least, the presentation in the afternoon today is uh, integrating Jupyter Notebook into your infrastructure from uh, Florian Gem. So thank you, Wiki. All right, thank you. So my name is Florian Riem, and as I said, I'll be talking about integrating Jupyter Notebooks into your infrastructure. First off, who am I and what is our infrastructure? I'm a software developer at Forschungszentrum Jülich, and I'm a member of the scientific IT systems team at the Peter Grünberg Institute and Jülich Center for Newton Science. So I'm not a Jupyter Hub developer, I'm just a user of Jupyter Hub, and I think it's a really, really good tool. So I want to present a little, a little bit about it. So about our infrastructure, we have about 500 active staff members and guest researchers. And um, to <laughs> handle the authentication, we use LEAP. We also provide a central storage system with two times 500 terabytes drive capacity. And we use NFS servers to um, provide the user directories using the storage. Uh, sorry, is this better? Okay. All right. Like this? Like this? Okay. <laughs> so we also manage a custom software distribution for CentOS 6, CentOS 7, and macOS. And we have 10 Linux compute clusters with over 4,500 cores. Now, why do we use Jupyter Notebooks? So Jupyter Notebooks combine uh, rich text with live code. So you can use Python, Julia, R, and a lot of other languages. Now, for us, it can serve as a platform for data analysis. And um, here's one example use case, um, the live visualization of neutron scattering data. And um, I think it's a really great tool for interactive and reproducible publications. Now, why would we want to use Jupyter Hub? First of, Jupyter Hub is a web service providing Jupyter Notebook servers for multiple users. So the benefits compared with just running your own um, Jupyter Notebook server on your own machine is that it's available worldwide and it's available on various devices. Basically, if you have a browser, you're good to go. One of the big benefits uh, for this is that the uh, user data and the experiment data is available inside this uh, notebook server, even if you don't have it on your local machine. The next benefit is that it's also available to our guest researchers. So if you would come to us, work on our facilities, and you need to use our software, maybe you don't have it on your own machine, but it's available in the um, Jupyter Notebooks that you can start with Jupyter Hub. Now, if you think about getting started with Jupyter Hub, you might just follow along with the README, and it will tell you to first install NPM and Node.js, to get a configurable HTTP proxy. We will get to that in a moment. Next, you just pip install Jupyter Hub and the notebook uh, package. And then you just run Jupyter Hub. And this is what you get. You have a server with some files, with the Python installation, with some local user accounts. And you start Jupyter Hub. Jupyter Hub will also start this configurable HTTP, HTTP proxy. And then you can connect through this proxy to JupyterApp. You sign in, JupyterApp checks your username and password, and then it will start a Jupyter Notebook server for you. You connect to the Notebook server, and it will pretty much look like any other Notebook server that you've ever run locally. You can start the, um, a Notebook inside it, for example, with a Python kernel, and then work on the um, files available on the server. Now, I mentioned before that we have central storage, and I can imagine most of you will also have something like it. So we don't want to work on files that are on the server that we use for JupyterHub. We want to work on the user files that are on the central storage. I mentioned that we use the network file system, NFS, for this. And you can do just the same with JupyterHub. You just have to NFS mount it on the server that you run JupyterHub. And then you can use all those files in your notebooks wherever you are. The next step is when you sign in on JupyterHub, I mentioned that you 
uh, enter your password and it will check the, um, the uh, local user accounts. Instead, we want to use a central authentication. So you can do that just as well in um, JupyterApp. You can have a central um, LDAP server and then JupyterApp will check if you're allowed to use the system. Now let's look at how we can do this with JupyterApp. So in JupyterApp there are a couple of points of customization and one of those is the authenticator class. There are a couple of authenticator classes available. The default is the PAM authenticator which can be used um, to sign in as a local user. And since we have an LDAP server, we want to use the LDAP Authenticator. Now, after installing the LDAP Authenticator package from pip, you just have to set the Authenticator class in your JupyterHub configuration, set the server address, the distinguished name template, and that's it. Afterwards, you have LDAP Authentication, and whoever is in your LDAP server can then sign in onto JupyterHub and create a notebook server. Next, if you want to serve multiple users, I mean, that's the core idea behind this, then everything works fine. First user signs in, their data is checked, and notebook server is started, they can start notebooks, work on the files, everything's fine. Next uh, user signs in, another notebook server is started, they start notebooks, they work on files. This all works fine, however, there is one big drawback in this. All users are on one server, so there is no isolation between the users, they're all on one machine. And this doesn't really scale up. I mean, two users running data analysis on one server, that's fine. 20 users, 200 users, this doesn't scale well. So one solution for the first problem is using Docker. I'm, I'm sure most of you will have worked with Docker before or know what Docker is. Docker you know, can use containers for virtualization. And what we can do here is to start up containers that contain the Jupyter Notebook server and the Python distribution and the notebooks, so every user will be in their own individual container. How do we do that with JupyterHub? We use a spawner class. This is the second point of customization for JupyterHub. The default is the so-called local process spawner, which starts a notebook as a local user. And since we want to use Docker, we use the Docker spawner, which starts a Docker co a container, and then inside this container, the notebook server is started. There are pre-built Docker images available on Docker Hub for Jupyter, but we decided to use our own custom image because one, it's really easy to do, and also it allows us to use the Linux distribution that our users normally use, in this case, CentOS 7. And afterwards, you just have to add these lines to the um, configuration. You set the spawner class. You set some configuration for the spawner class, in this case the image which should be used for the containers, and you tell JupyterHub the, the hub IP so that the containers know where to find JupyterHub. There are a couple um, problems that, might, that you might have when you use this. The first one is that you cannot mount file systems from inside Docker, usually. And what you can do is to mount um, volumes the first and most simple way is to use the um, bind mounts, the second is to use Docker volumes. So in our case we use NFS and we can do both. We can either mount it onto the server and then bound, bind mount it into the containers or you can have a uh, Docker volume that, has a, um, that is of the local driver and the NFS type. Now how we do this is that we have um, subclassed the Docker spawner and um, the Docker spawner of, has a property volumes, and this can be used to control which volumes will be mounted when the container is started. And by subclassing it, we can use additional information to decide which, um, which volumes should be mounted and from where. The next um, thing that we do in the right same step, uh, the mounting of the volumes, is that we can add our own custom software distribution, which I men mentioned earlier, via NFS and volumes into the container so that they not only have CentOS 7, the Linux distribution that the users are used to, they also have the um, software that they have on their normal desktop machines while they're at work. Now the next problem that might occur is there is no X server running by default if you use a pre-built um, Docker container. So some visualization tools require the X um, to 
for example, use OpenGL, for example, GL3. But it's quite simple to work around this. If you use your own custom Docker image for this, you can just run the X window virtual frame buffer, XVFB, and this will provide an um, X window system for the Jupyter Notebook server. And then you can, for example, have some nice 3D visualizations in this case, using the Gallium LLVM pipe software riser. So it won't be awfully fast, but I mean, you probably don't do very heavy compute intensive visualization inside a Jupyter notebook. And if you do, well, get some GPUs. So what we have after this is that we have the containers, now only with the Jupyter notebook server and with the actual notebooks. We have the um, remote files, we have the software distribution from a remote server, and we have the LDAP server. So it's quite nice, we have isolation. We also have the normal software um, for the users, including the operating system. But all users are still on one server, so we didn't solve all that much. And the solution is, for example, to use Docker Swarm. So for those of you who haven't um, heard of Docker Swarm before or haven't used it, Previously, I mentioned that we can start containers on our server. Instead, we can also start these containers on other servers. And Docker Swarm is a way to, um, to solve this by adding other servers into, um, into this swarm as swarm nodes. And then whenever we need a new container for, um, for a Jupyter notebook or the notebook server, we can just tell Docker Swarm, please start another container somewhere and it will do it. So in this case, we have to put our JupyterHub installation, including Python and this configurable proxy, into its own container. And as soon as the first user signs in and their data is correct, we get somewhere in this swarm, on any machine available, a um, Jupyter Notebook server in their, its own container. Since we can just add servers to this swarm, this also supports a lot of users. So with um, this, to do this, we need the um, swarm spawner. It's somewhat similar to the Docker spawner, but the big, um, the big benefit is that we can distribute the users among our um, swarm nodes. To configure this, we again set the spawner class, in this case to the swarm spawner by, uh, from the Cassini spawner package. We set our service name so that um, the, uh, that the spawner knows which service runs JupyterHub. We also work with a Docker network, and we set a prefix so that we later on know which services or containers are part of um, our notebook servers. Now, here comes the live demo, and let's hope that the Wi-Fi gods are nice to us. Uh, Okay, so if we go onto the um, site for our JupyterHub, this is what we see. We can sign in using our normal LDAP accounts. And there we go. It started a notebook server for us. We have um, our usual files on the remote server. And now I can, for example, go here and I have some notebooks, have some files. The big difference to a normal notebook server is this additional button up here, the control panel but it just allows me to either stop my server if I'm done with it, or go back to my server. Now to show a little Jupyter Notebook. If it will load, yeah, here we are. Kernel has been started, and we're loading math, and there we go. So this is pretty much the same as if you had it running on your machine, just that all the files are on the remote system, all the CPU load is on the remote system, and we can use all the software that is, in, that is installed there. So for example, here I can use the um, PyGSL package, I can use GR, and in the end, we also get some nice rendering thanks to the X Windows server. For those who haven't used Notebook before, I really recommend it since you get some nice math like this. It's really great. <laughs> now, back to the slides. So maybe you think now, ah, oh, this is great, but I don't want to use Docker Swarm. I want to use Kubernetes. Okay, use Kubernetes. There's the QB spawner for this. So 
Since these are just additional classes who only have the task to um, start a new notebook server somewhere, it's quite easy to extend. Someone did it for Kubernetes, so you're welcome. Also, if you want to try it out, you can just start a um, local process spawner, the default, or you can use the pseudo spawner, which is almost the same with the difference that it doesn't require root uh, privileges to start um, notebook servers for other users. So, for example, if you just want to have a small Jupyter Hub for a few colleagues, then you can use that. Maybe you also don't want to use um, LDAP authentication. In this case, as I said, the default is to use uh, PAM and the PAM Authenticator, which allows you to uh, sign in as a local user. Or if you want to sign in using your Google account or GitHub account or GitLab account or anything else, you can use the O Authenticator, which uses OAuth. Or maybe you have Kerberos. In this case, you can use the KDC Authenticator. Or maybe you have something really arcane. In this case, you can just build your own. It's quite simple, so let me show you. Um, I mentioned that to extend um, JupyterHub, you, ha you have to replace classes, and you can just subclass the authenticator class up here. And all you need to do in the case of an authenticator is to write one method. This method needs to be a Tornado um, coroutine called authenticate and it will be provided with um, the username and the password. And then either the username and password are correct, you return the username and Jupyter handles the rest for you, or they aren't correct, you just return nothing and JupyterHub also handles the rest for you. So it's really quite easy to extend this and add additional methods of authentication. So that JupyterHub actually uses this. Again, we set the authenticator class, in this case, to our actual class object and not to just do a string. And that's it. Afterwards, we have our simple authenticator that I hope nobody of you will use. So to summarize this, JupyterHub allows you to, um, to have multiple Jupyter notebook servers. It manages the creation of these servers, the deletion of these servers, and having them available. The authenticator classes allow you to control how your users can sign in, so you can just use the um, authentication method or that your company has established. And spawner classes control how the Jupyter Notebook uh, servers are started. My recommendation is definitely to use something Docker-based, but it's completely up to you if you use the Docker spawner, Docker Swarm, Kubernetes, or if you decide to go against using Docker. If you use Docker, I also recommend um, a custom Docker image. I mean, if your servers are completely identical to the normal work environment of your coworkers, then you can uh, skip this. But if you use a custom Docker image, you get exactly the right um, system that your uh, users are used to. Also, you can use the um, volumes feature so that the users have access to their files. And you can let, uh, really uh, scale this using Docker Swarm or Kubernetes. So, personally, I think JupyterHub is a really great tool. I think it's awesome. And a big thank you to the developers of JupyterHub. If you think, oh, okay, there's some part of my infrastructure that I don't think um, is already uh, handled, we have plenty of time for questions. Thank you. Time for the great presentation now. Is there any question for Florian Jin? Okay. Uh, well, first, let me thank you for your talk. Uh, very interesting, though. Um, the question would be, have you tried to uh, like dynamically scale the Docker images to servers? Like when like some people start like, lots of, uh, say, machine learning uh, computations, like all on the same server, that the Docker goes to another server and uh, opens up more resources? So since we use Docker Swarm, as far as I'm aware, the, usually way, uh, the usual way for this is that just new containers that are started um, are distributed. So. If we already have notebook servers for several users on one machine, on one node, and then these users all would, um, would use a lot of the, uh, resources, then we uh, wouldn't be able to push one aside. I think that's, as far as I'm aware, that's not supported by Docker Swarm at the moment. Um, 
what you can do, of course, is to um, limit the uh, CPU usage or memory usage, but that's, that might not be what you want. Um, when in doubt, you can, uh, the user can always stop their server, restart their server, and solve this issue. But I, I'm not aware of any solution that automatically moves the whole container somewhere else, which I think would be needed for this case. Yeah, I'm not absolutely sure. I think I remember something like like that you can uh, have some Jupyter workers underneath. Well, maybe you could spawn a like, container from a container and put that into some dynamically cluster or whatever. But uh, I, I haven't worked with that, but since Jupyter Hub just needs somehow to talk to the uh, notebook server, I'm sure everything that works for normal notebook servers should also in some way work um, if used behind uh, Jupyter Hub. Thank you. Okay. Um, just uh, so I understand it correctly, when you say uh, start my server or stop my server or something, um, does that correspond to a whole container or a process within one container? This corresponds to the whole container. So okay, so, but you were, you were also talking about uh, multiple users in one container maybe. Um, what I mentioned is by default, you're using, everyone is one process on the, um, on this machine, so you have this situation. Um, we wanted to get around this, uh, having already the users together, so the first switch was to this here, to Docker, and in this case already every user gets their own container. And later on, using Docker Swarm, this is, all, uh, this is still the same. Each user has their own container. They are marked to belong to these users um, in their name, and uh, if you decide to stop your, um, your server, then this container uh, gets killed. Okay, so, uh, yeah, this is how I thought it should be. <laughs> Thanks. Is there any other question? Okay. Hello, thanks for your talk. Um, I have the question if you have any stop for overflowing data. So if somebody is calculating pi or something like that, uh, that you're in saving or... Okay, so uh, I just mention it in passing that there is a way to limit the uh, research usage. So, I mean, of course, if they calculate pi and write it all to disk, you have to have the usual quotas in place, but if you are worried about memory usage or CPU usage, you can limit those. So you can either do this um, directly on the, on the Docker level, or you can also set, um, for example, the mem limit configuration value inside of JupyterHub. Though in this case you have to um, use a spawner that supports it, but Docker supports this feature. So you could say um, each user can at most use so and so many uh, CPUs at the same time, or doesn't that uh, many um, RAM? Okay, and, and are you using that uh, to offer for out unauthenticated users something? No, or? we are not allowing unauthenticated users at the moment, so. Um, the guest researchers that I mentioned, they also get an account in our LDAP um, system. So at the moment, everyone has played nice. So we didn't have to limit them and they can use as much um, uh, CPU and memory as they can. But of course, if this um, becomes needed, then we can do it. Okay, thanks. Is there any other question? Okay. Um, in this situation, what happens if the, the user doesn't properly sound, sign out and shut down their notebook, but just goes away and then leaves it on overnight or whatever? Does it, is there some timeout involved where the Docker container is shut down again? Or? So um, in this configuration, it's really like as long as the um, user doesn't stop the server and the um, Jupyter Hub itself isn't stopped, the container stays alive as long as you don't run into um, resource limitations, this has the benefit that spawning or restarting the uh, notebook server when the user signs on the next time is very fast because the server is already there. But of course, you need to, um, you need to be aware of the memory usage. Um, I showed... Um, 
I showed, a, I, I, I think I removed it before, but I used to have a, um, another line of configuration in here, which um, had the value for remove containers. Because the default setting with Jupyter Hub is to keep the containers even if Jupyter Hub itself is stopped. So that if you are working with a Jupyter Notebook server, and for some reason Jupyter Hub is restarted, your state would, be, um, would still stay there and uh, you wouldn't lose anything that you had been working on or the kernel wouldn't be stopped, things like that. Um, in, when we used that configuration, we set it to remove the containers simply for the fact that if we have to restart JupyterHub, it might be a good idea to clean up the um, containers. It should not be a long-term storage solution or something like that. Okay. Can I have a few questions? Sorry, I have a few questions. So for question here, uh, can you tell me some positive if I use a Jupyter Notebook and Jupyter Hub when I connect with, uh, when I do with Spark and or Adobe? Um, could, could you repeat that? This means, is there any positive when I use a Jupyter Hub instead by Jupyter Notebook when I work with Adobe or Spark? Um, I haven't worked with Spark uh, in this case uh, or with Hadoop, but it, it's basically just another um, Jupyter uh, notebook server, just not on your machine, but on another machine. So as long as the uh, image that you're using to start the machine supports your, uh, the software with, that you want to use, then you can use it just like a normal machine. I mean, there are a couple limits to using Docker containers. For example, um, the mounts or everything else that is related to privileges. But um, as long as it's just a user tool, then there should be no reason that it doesn't work. Okay, another question is, uh, I have uh, some script. For example, my script have to start every 5 a.m. to note in the weather of the city. Uh, so if you shut down the a machine, so what happened with my script? It can run, run or not? Um, you can, you could set up uh, a script like that on this, but that's not the, uh, the main purpose of the, of the system. So of course, if you use um, Jupyter Hub or any notebook server, I mean, you can start a terminal in here and you can basically do anything inside of this container, including things like cron jobs. But that's not, that's not the, uh, the main idea behind it. It's mainly to start um, Jupyter Notebooks and to work in Jupyter Notebooks. Sorry, can you, can you back the last uh, page? Uh, no, no, in the website. Uh, you mean this Okay, here? okay, can, can I see the cluster? This, the cluster? Okay. Uh, we don't uh, use the, the running iPython. Or another running? Okay, so if you shut down, the, this means it shut down all the Jupyter and the file, right? Um, Last time you say you shut down, so it shut down all the files running, right? Okay. No, no, it's uh, uh, last time you saw that when you control, by control pen and you shut down, this means all the um, program will shut down, right? You mean no. this? Uh, no, the control pen. And you shut down. Ah, the, ah yeah. and the control panel, it's okay. Shut down all, everything, right? Um, this will stop the whole container. So ah, afterwards, okay. it, it will, of course, first stop the, um, okay. the notebook server, but it will then stop the container. And if I do this mm -hmm. and hope that the Wi Fi is still nice with me, hopefully, it should. Okay. So there, it, it stopped the container, and now if I go to my server, it will load a bit, as we can see up here, hopefully, and there we go. Okay. There's the completely uh, fresh container. Yeah, but you go back running. Okay, this means that every uh, script, if I run like schedule for every 5 a.m., it cannot run, and it automatically shut down, so I can get the weather in the day, okay. Basically, it's the same as if you had the um, notebooks or another no. script running on your machine and then you shut down the machine. So everything, it's just a, a clean reboot. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Is there any other question for Jim? 
Yeah, thanks. Um, what about version control? I see you have a network file system for your end users. Uh, that's where they keep their notebooks. Um, but how do you integrate it with any Git or Mercurial? Do or do you, or do you or don't you? Well, um, this is something that we leave to the users. So if they want to use Git, which I would recommend, then um, they can do that. Either they um, have their have this file system on their own machines, or in this case, we can start a new terminal. And there's Git. So they could do this in, in the terminal. There's no built-in integration to say, OK, I want to uh, commit this state, or I want to push it. Um, but if they want to use uh, Git, then that's good, and they can do it. I see. Thank you. OK. Any other question? Uh, so, uh, we already saw that you have uh, multiple languages installed, which is uh, supported by Jupyter, like R or uh, uh, I think Julia, if mm -hmm. I saw correctly. Yep. Is it any more difficult to do that on Jupyter Hub than it is on a normal local Jupyter installation? Almost no. So, the, o the only difficulty here is that um, we decided that we don't uh, mount the normal user home folder into the home folder of the container so that your configurations uh, won't mix. So if you um, install a, um, a kernel for Jupyter, then this is usually done in, uh, the, inside your home directory or it's done um, globally for all users. So these kernels are part of our software distribution, so they are um, in user local. You can, of course, install a kernel. However, you have to take precautions so that it will also be installed the next time you stop the container restart it when the um, actual home directory is um, removed. To allow this, we have added, uh, we have added a, um, a simple profile um, file that will be executed before the notebook server starts so that you can have um, virtual environments in there, you can have conda environments in there, additional languages, um, it all works. So you just have to make sure that the configuration for Jupyter is, um, is either persisted or recreated um, when you restart the container. Any other question? No, so we say thank one more time for Jim's very interesting presentation. <laughs>